All right, this video is just uh, some practice identifying or creating null and alternative hypotheses. So let's take a peek. Am I broadcasting the right way here? I think I am. So let's look at some of these practice situations. The objectives for this video are to understand the two hypothesis system again and to learn how to construct null and alternative hypotheses from verbal or written descriptions and to understand one-sided versus two-sided alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is always two-sided. It's always non-specific, non-directional. But the alternative can be either one. And then correctly identify from the research description which one you're dealing with. Now I've put some notes on these slides. Uh, pay attention to them. They're not just optional little details. In most cases, they actually have some new information on them. So exercise number one. What I recommend you do is that you stop and try and write these things out when I tell you to pause before I give you the answer, and then check your answer against what's on the screen. That's the only way you're going to know if you've really learned this. So this is the kind of thing I'm going to give you on tests and uh, quizzes and homeworks and things. I'm going to give you a, a verbal scenario that implies a sort of a hypothesis, and then you have to kind of make that much more specific with the null and alternative thing. So let's say Jennifer believes that she has more friends than the average college student does. Is she right? So what are the null and the alternative hypothesis going to be there? I recommend you pause now before we go to the next slide and write them down, and then go to the next slide and see if you got it right. Okay, moving on. <coughs> so one way to write this out, and there's not always exactly one way to do this, um, but it's probably something like the null hypothesis is Jennifer does not have more friends. Now don't say Jennifer has fewer friends because the null hypothesis the way we use it in statistics is not usually directional like that. Not, it's not going to say fewer. It's just going to say not this. It's not going to tell you which direction the not the, that it goes in. It's just going to say it's not this thing. So not more friends than the average college student. Or you could say she has an average number of friends, which is the same thing. Anything that boils down to that equivalent idea. And the alternative would be that she has more friends. Now you could have the alternative be that she has a different number of friends, either more or less, or I mean fewer than the average college student. But I think the question implies more. You can see the word more there, uh, although that's not always a perfect indicator. So this is a directional hypothesis because she seems interested in only one outcome. She wants to, in one direction of the outcome. She's interested in whether she has more friends than average, at least as it's written. And then null hypothesis is always a non-directional or point hypothesis. It just says she doesn't have more friends. That implies a specific number. It just implies she has exactly the average. So if you know what that average is, then that's the null hypothesis. Jennifer's number of friends is, you know, 3.7 or something. So here's another one. Researchers studying climate change predict that global ocean temperatures have risen in the past 20 years. What are these hypotheses? Moving on. The null hypothesis might be that average temperatures are no higher or they're equal to or no different from the previous thousand years. And the alternative would be that they are higher. So in this, this is different from the example I had on the previous slide because that was about temperature fluctuations. This is about the actual temperature value itself, high versus low. And the prediction is that they have risen on average. <coughs> so. Once again, we have a directional hypothesis. Now note that our hypotheses need to be about something specific and measurable. So in this case, we had to modify the original research question a bit to make it specific. Research questions tend to be fairly general, and that's what they should be. Uh, hypotheses need to get specific. You need to list something that can be measured. And a real hypothesis would probably get even more specific than this if you were really doing study. And sometimes we uh, use average and total, things like this. You see I worked in average global ocean temperatures in each of these. Because we're grouping together a whole bunch of things. Like let's say we get temperatures for every year. Well, for a thousand years, you need the average. For 20 years, you need the average. You need something that's not just one number. So we do that averaging business a lot. And there's a lot of ways we can do this. This isn't the only way to do this, but there definitely are a lot of ways that would not work for this. So exercise three is the price of oil related to terrorism in the Middle East. You should be looking and seeing that that first one's pretty specific, price of oil, but terrorism is pretty general, and you're going to have to make some decisions about how to make that specific for your study. So write out your hypotheses if you really want to learn this stuff, and then pause for a second, 
until you do that, and then move on with me. Okay. So I, I settled on there is no relationship between the price of oil in a given year and the number of terrorist acts committed in the Middle East in that year. And then I just changed just that one little phrase. Instead of there is no relationship, I said there is a relationship for the alternative hypothesis. This is a non-directional hypothesis, and it's about association. So non-directional means the association could be positive or negative. <coughs> and we'll learn more about associations, including correlation, which is one specific type of it later in the semester. But uh, all you need to really know is that we're studying a relationship, and there are ways to turn that into a number. So this is about association. And the price in that association is already extremely specific and measurable. It's easy. Just look on you know, websites and tell you what the price of crude is right now. But terrorism is extremely vague, super vague. So I had to choose something specific and measurable. So I chose number of terrorist acts. There's a lot of other things we could do that aren't number of terrorist acts. And we didn't even say given year. I, I put in the given year business because you need to be able to compare apples to apples somehow. So I had to make some decisions. And this is where a lot of research happens, is those decisions. And of course, where people can be criticized because maybe they didn't make the best ones. So exercise number four. Are women and men equally likely to break up with their romantic partners? So think of a known alternative hypothesis for this. If possible, please write them down to make sure that you're committing to it, because the wording is important, and you practice with that wording. Okay, moving on. I decided, on average, the null hypothesis, women will report having initiated the same number of breakups as men report. And then for men, on average, or sorry, the alternative hypothesis, on average, they will report having initiated a different number. So I don't think the question makes it clear which direction the researchers think things are going. They're just interested if there's a difference. So this is a non-directional hypothesis because it, we're interested in either women have more initiated breakups than men or vice versa. Either one's interesting to us. Now sex and likelihood of breaking up, there are a lot of upper ways to operationalize the second one and I chose one. I chose that if you ask women that they will, you know, how many breakups have they initiated, that they, that's it, just the number that they report, and they ask men. Uh, but there are a lot of other ways you could measure this. Even sex can be operationalized more than one way. So number five, Montana is much colder on average in the winter than New York. Does that mean that public schools in Montana close for weather reasons more frequently than those in New York do? So come up with a null alternative hypothesis, and then when you're done, unpause this thing and go on to the next slide. Now notice this is not about whether Montana is colder than New York. That's just an, a little introduction to the question. So my null hypothesis that, I hypothesis that I chose was that the average number of weather days, like snow days or something, per school in Montana is the same as the average number per school in New York. This implies some complex stuff. You have to look each school, figure out the number of weather days for some period of time, which I didn't specify and I probably should have. You have to find out the number of weather days for each school, which is going to be hundreds in New York and maybe even thousands in, or hundreds of Montana, maybe thousands in New York. And then you have to come up with the average for Montana and the average to New York. There's a lot of data processing I'm implying with some simple little words here. So the alternative hypothesis is that the average number of weather days in Montana is greater um, because you've got this clue up here. Does it mean more frequently? So that's a clue that the researchers are thinking in a directional way here. So this is a directional question, just like um, some of the previous ones. <coughs> the researchers seem much more interested in whether Montana has more, more snow days than New York, not so much interested in whether it's fewer, because of the way they set things up, because of the information that led them to their hypothesis. Number six, has light pollution along migration routes increased migration, or changed, sorry, I said increased, changed migration flight times for Canada geese? Come up with some alternative and null hypothesis there, and then unpause and check it on this slide. So I chose a null hypothesis. You can see how I chose to operationalize my variables here. I had to, to come up with hypotheses. The average migration times, um, so that's one choice, on routes with higher levels of light pollution. So I chose routes with higher level versus lower level. There are different ways to operationalize that. You could just look at the level of pollution. You could look at time, like before pollution, light pollution started versus after, etc. But I chose on routes with higher level of light pollution. The migration times on high light pollution routes 
are no different from migration times on low light pollution routes. And then the alternative is that they are different. Now, the way this is phrased, uh, the question just says, has it changed? Has light pollution changed the flight times? It doesn't say has it increased them or decreased them. It just says has it changed the flight times? So it's non-directional. And it's really not clear how to operationalize this question. I suppose if I were in environmental studies or biology or something, I would understand. But I had to kind of make some decisions there. And you will too in this class. You have to make some decisions here and there. All right. The end of this lecture now.